Welcome to the Menopause and Cancer podcast, where we speak with cancer patients, survivors, and incredible menopause experts to help us find solutions to our symptoms and ideas to improve our health. My name is Danny Binnington, and today on the podcast, we're joined by a clinical consultant oncologist who's going to share with us his number one top tip of how he thinks all patients can really transform their experience of managing menopause after cancer quite drastically. And I'm all open ears because I think we need to work on our mini menopause revolution together. For the last couple of years, I've been giving you all of these podcast episodes to empower you to become the empowered patient and also to look for the resources and find the solutions that might help you along a little bit in your journey. But it's really also that we need to bring in all of the doctors, oncologists and surgeons and for them to meet us with open ears. And I know appointment times are very short. We've got really important things to get through. And at the same time, we've got to start to bring up menopause more so that we can become the change makers because we know millions of women are put into menopause because of their cancer treatment and from about all of the women we've surveyed, 90% say they've not had the help they so desperately needed. I get emails every single week from people telling us that they feel suicidal and really, really alone and desperate with their symptoms and their thoughts and feelings. And it is for all of us to create bigger change. And you are part of this change maker revolution so that together we can, yes, stand up for ourselves, empower each other, support one another, but also communicate with our doctors so that they can learn from us. And so that that change can go all the way up into the bigger healthcare systems, wherever you are in the world. I truly believe we are part of a mini revolution here and we won't stop going until we've achieved what we've set out to do. And that is for more people who are managing menopause after cancer to get the information and support they need. Now, Dr. Nabil El Madawi is a clinical consultant oncologist. He works at a really busy Yorkshire NHS uh, learning hospital and trust. And he's brilliant because he's really helping us think today on the podcast how we can all create the change we need. And I've also got an amazing poem for you that I want to share with you at the end of the podcast. So stick around and listen to my poem of becoming a change maker. Good morning, Nabil. Thank you very much for your time. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much. Good morning, Danny. I was uh, really looking forward to this meeting. Yeah. So, Nabil, sometimes when I speak to an oncologist, I feel um, I need to prepare myself a little bit because I think you get bad reputation. Because when I'm on social media, in my Facebook groups, on Instagram, for example, lots of people say, their oncologist didn't prepare them for what's to come. No one really mentioned the menopause was going to have such a big impact on them. But I know from you and so many of your colleagues, you're doing a tremendous job. How big a conversation piece is the menopause when you see your patients? Uh, well, menopause is a big problem in cancer patients, and that's to do with the predominantly the treatment that can result into complications which can be ablative to ovarian hormonal function, not just the reproductive function. Uh, it's part of the mandatory requirement now from the Royal College uh, informed consent that we would have to mention menopause uh, could be a, a complication uh, of the treatment. This is something that's been practiced for a while, but you're right, it's not very well uh, sticked up on really well. Uh, it is something that is now is going to be on a standardized consent form for from the Royal Colleges for cancer patients. So it should not be forgotten. Uh, the issue also not just about the clinicians may not be approaching the subject in depth. It may just be said as a word, I think, like menopause. But then how we manage that menopause, I don't think we discuss that really well. Uh, and that's something we need to improve on. Uh, but the issue also on the patient themselves, when you mention this is the treatment of your cancer, this is a complications, this is a survivor benefit. This is a risk of failure of treatment. And then when you mention the world, uh, the word menopause, it doesn't seem to be the most important thing patients are interested to, to focus on. And we end up picking this, absolutely. And we end up picking this bag piece after the patient gone into the survivorship journey. 
Yeah. And I think initially, and I remember it so well from myself, I would have given my left arm if anyone said this will reduce your risk of recurrence or your survival rates will improve. And so we do everything to survive. And this is when I had contact with my oncologist. And if people are listening to this, they'll think, yeah, this is the conversations you have with your oncologist are very much about that survival initially, isn't it, the active treatment and how do we manage that? And then you send your patients off into survivorship, but you have put a lot of them into the menopause and then they're kind of ending up in this la la land isn't it like who do they access you are very hard to get hold of we know that and many clinical nurse specialists are brilliant and many for them menopause isn't that much on their radar yeah of course i mean what what we need to know that cancer induced menopause is iatrogenic menopause iatrogenic is a technical term we use as medical colleagues which we mean that medically induced, it's not like physiologically induced, because menopause is a physiological condition. And as menopause happens physiologically, the body adapts to the changes. And normally it takes, some ladies have it quick, like in over three to six months, but some ladies may take up years to achieve the, the full, full menopause. Uh, and, and during that, the, the body physiology adapts and the woman realizes something is changing and then they end up attend either the GPs or the look pharmacy and try to do whatever can help. However, with cancer patient, as you you know kindly shared your example, it's it's uh, it's an it's a medically induced and it's a sudden. So it's, if patient doesn't have the time to actually understand what is the physiological changes happening to my body. Uh, yes, we are very busy and we focus on giving chemotherapy and radiotherapy and surgeries. And sometimes the need for uh, addressing this is becomes like a secondary, maybe tertiary or maybe final uh, things to, to be inter in, in, interested on. Uh, what we know from research that 70% of uh, cancer survivors, regardless of the breasts or uh, uh, women who have uh, other type of non homological tumors, they will end up one day developing uh, men menopause, cancer treatment induced menopause. And a lot of them result on genital urinary dysfunctional as well, which is physical manifestation of inability to have the normal uh, female functions. And we know also from research that only 30% of these women will seek a medical help and about almost 70 to 90 percent of them they seek that medical help two years or more after they have been treated with a cancer so there's a big group of patients that we see in there and very little of them they actually go and require help and the one who require help most of them they require years and years after the suffering from the problem you're absolutely right we are healthcare professionals as part of cancer survivorships as part of the consent as part of treatment should be addressed early uh, because that would bring awareness and make it it's an important factor of the patient well-being and enjoying living after treatment of cancer to address it, not just pass it as a word during consent and then not proper treatment has been addressed at the very early of uh, the treatment journey. Hey, thanks for watching this episode. 73% of people who watch my podcast haven't yet clicked the subscribe button and 11% haven't hit the button to turn on notifications. I want these conversations to reach as many women as possible who might need to hear them. So if you've ever enjoyed listening to this podcast, please hit subscribe now. Because mm, 70%, that's a huge number. And for only 30% to go and seek help years later, that means we have this big void, isn't it? This information void, it's a big hole, we're all swallowed up in it. And it's no one's fault, isn't it? It's just where we are at the moment. And I wonder, because the whole general menopause conversation has so boomed over the last few years, we're sort of like a byproduct of that conversation. I sort of started to join that menopause movement thinking, hang on a minute, what about me? What about us? What about all the people in my Facebook group? Like all the women after different cancers, who talks about them, who helps them whilst everyone else was campaigning at the Houses of Parliament talking about the general menopause conversation. So we're kind of like, I feel catching up. I wonder whether we're also catching up in how we help survivors. Like the emphasis was very much on improving statistics and survival rates and it needs to be that way and now we're kind of like catching up thinking okay we're all going to or many of us luckily are going to live longer how can we also improve that quality of life 
Absolutely. I mean, when we look at this uh, in general tabs, we also can include maids as well. Maid cancers, survival from testicular tumors, survival from state cancers. They also suffer from main manifolds. They lose their testosteronic functions and that also impact on their sexual well-being and also their mental and physical well-being and, and that. But just to keep our focus today on the women cancers, I would say that uh, NICE, uh, not NICE, ASCO, which is American Society of Clinical Oncology, and NCCN, which is National Canadian Cancer Network, they both have made a conjoint guidelines, which specifically target this. And the very specific on the first bullet point of their guideline is saying that the cancer, genital urinary dysfunction, and menopause and survival, shit, that has to be addressed directly to the patient so the question has to be directly open to the question and the question has to be asked repeatedly at each visit so there's a mandated mm -hmm. on the north of the atlantic at the western side of it that we have to ask the patient directly and we have to in every visit we have to ask this question that manipulates and genital urinary dysfunction now what we lack in our country despite of our good effort to improve our patient survival and we are doing better most cancer survive uh, breast cancers now survive years and years and prostate cancers and you know different cancers and we have not have developed the formal guidelines to address this issue separately because you're right cancers menopause and genitory dysfunction is a byproduct of a treatment and is not addressed as a medical condition as its own entity is either general post cancer complication or a menopause in general but its average needs and requirement is, is absolutely paramount. And there's also another publication which is saying that looking at the top unmet needs for cancer patients that will fade to deliver. Number five comes in menopause and genital function. That's on survey on, on cancer patients. So mm. you're right, we do need uh, the formal guideline. We need to follow our West Atlantic colleagues and try to develop formal guideline and to be addressed this patient that they actually require that to be uh, looked into and have a formal treatment management pathway. Mm. And then I guess you start the conversation, which is brilliant. If a clinical nurse specialist, if the oncologist, the surgeon talks about the issues that we might be facing, this is the first way to say, we understand you might be experiencing difficulty. Let's talk about it. If you're not ready to talk about it, maybe we talk about it at your next appointment. Because sometimes we're not always receptive as a patient, aren't we? It's not always the right day. As you say, it needs to repeatedly be asked. But once the conversation is opened, do you have guidelines that tell all of you clinicians exactly what you can do with different patients? Like we have email after email from people saying, I've had this type of cancer. Is vaginal estrogen safe for me? I've had that type of breast cancer. Can I have vaginal estrogen? I'm on this uh, treatment. Is hormone replacement therapy systemic okay for me or what are my options do you have guidance as clinicians yeah i mean guidance is result of uh, proper research and publications and a proper for clinicians are interested to make the guidance i think there is more and more emerging publications now talk about the safety of using uh vagina estrogen for instance or using estrogen on uh, uh, on non-hormonal based tumors but these are dependent at the moment, I think, mostly to do with uh, clinicians are searching among uh, publications and finding the, the best available guidance to help the patient. That takes a personal interest, that takes a well-being of the person and taking the X well to go and find that evidence. And that has become a clinician to clinician dependent and mm. depends on how much time available in that clinician hand and or the nurse specialist or the surgeon, uh, and then depends on the quality of reading the papers. Some papers, they are on publication, they're not top quality. So they're, the formal guidance to say, let's say if I had uh, treated a lady with a certain type of cancer and now she's struggling with cancer menopause, uh, there isn't like a document which produced by a body which will say, this is, uh, this is how you should manage the cervical cancer, then this is, can be done safely. If this is endometrial, this can be done safely. It's a breast cancer, hormonal, non-hormonal. This is, can be also done safely. And then that is something that patient will be comforted about. Patient, in time, they will learn about it. And then they will come forward and asking. Now, yeah. yes, and, and that's called about 
public awareness because they know there is a safety net there to protect them. And as sometimes I see myself, we treat patients with certain gynecological cancers. And then after that, they ask the question and then you say, okay, well, I know from this and this. And sometimes you can see the anxiety in the voice of being able, well, I'm not bothered. I will, no, I'll just say it like this. And for some extent, it could be a young woman of cervical cancer, it could be as young as in her 20s and 90s, when we treat them with radiation and graphic therapy, which is internal radiation into the, the, the cervical uh, uterine, uh, they would end up being menopausal and very early age. And that doesn't just affect their sexual function, doesn't affect their hormonal function, but also affect the normal physiological function for the cardiovascular system, for the bony system, for the hormonal system, their ability to be able to focus. And we know very well, and there's enough publication, cervical cancer patients, especially the squamous cell type, which is the most common type that's one driven by HPV virus. It's not hormonal driven tumor, it's driven by HPV virus. And if we were delivering menopause early due to treatment, there's no risk whatsoever for this young woman to be able to receive HRT. So this is increasing. Most most people, clinicians, they say, okay, you finish treatment, you say to work. But we do have sometimes uh, the lack of that information to be safely available to general practice because GPs are the one who's going to prescribe the, the, the HRT. And the patient will feel confidently that it's not going to bring the cancer back again. So uh, the, 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 the reality of the matter that as much as there are some publications and there's some information and some information are really good and safe, but it's not kind of like, as you're saying, be put together in a one document by a professional body either. Well, we know a very nice guideline or a royal college to give us the clear guidance so either GPs or nurses or clinicians, ecologists or surgeons they all refer to the same Bible, let's call it, yeah? They would just be safely, this, and the patient, when they ask their patient information needs this, and they, I can't remember any hospital work when there is actually uh, patient information leaks that on the waiting area, talking about post-cancer-induced menopause. No. Yeah. No. And, and this is where we feel so many women really fall through the net, really. We have worked with young bowel cancer survivors in their early 20s. This was in collaboration with a charity called Trekstock, and there was no contraindication for hormone replacement therapy. And no one's asked them the question. They've gone months after the radiotherapy, the ovaries have stopped working, and no one has asked them the question. So in their sort of follow-up pathway the menopause conversation and the question wasn't one of them and these women have really been failed and it has almost destroyed the quality of their survivorship life because the symptoms have become so bad for them and this is really where i think we all need to do much better work together and and i'm still thinking what is the grand plan that we can come up with in the next two to three years so that we can really change this landscape because for so many women so much help is available, whether that is hormonal or non-hormonal. And like you say, it starts with the conversation. But but I do need a bit of help coming up with a grand plan. Now you're part of the team, Nabil. <laughs> I've got to rope you all in. I've got to rope you all in to do uh, something really amazing because it just doesn't seem right to me that we put women into these states and then just kind of like let away. them get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is not very attentive. It's not very caring. And it's uh, it's kind of like we hiding behind, let's call it our failure of treatment. Yes, we succeed to treat the cancer, but we fade them in a way, put them back to their normal being. In the same way, what we used to call in the past, if you remember really well, back 20, 30 years ago, they used, when we used to do mastectomies and reconstruction, it wasn't part of the deal. It wasn't like breath. And the body image was like something looked at Why you're asking. It has the patient to ask for it and say, I need, my reconstruction back and all this but now as part of the of the must requirement only because good patients and good people start what you're saying making the noise i'm actually specifying we we have to take that breast out this mutilated that patient now we have to make sure it's part of the service that will bring that but as much as possible to normality and then we even now include nipple tattooing and nipple shaping and and all yeah. this, and yeah, so these these are, these things didn't start from nothing. These started by people like yourself. They started to to create that noise and being a whistleblower to say, "Stop here, we need to do something." 
where where we go, I think I think from here, I think what you do is just bringing public awareness and creating the knowledge to to people and the clinician that something here needs to be addressed. At least the, the paramount. But there are the other things probably need to be looked at. I think we need to see how we can make this to start with as an acceptable, independent condition. Because if we let's say, yeah. okay, cancer induced menopause is a medical condition. Its own entity is not part of general menopause. It is not part of cancer complication in itself because this, why is it condition? And it's not just about trying to raise the profile of it. It's a condition because it's a something is untreatable or is incurable. It's treatable, but incurable. And it remains with patient and it have its own repercussion and complication in patient life in general, it can affect the marriage, the professions and and it can affect also physically because it's not just we're talking about feeling good about the hormone that can affect the cardiovascular system, it can affect the, the bone structural system. So it is in itself is a chronic condition that is treatable that affect other body. And I think the starting point, if there will ever be to be a coded independent medic, that will bring the attention to it. Then, obviously, as you said, we said earlier, is collecting those good evidence around and a good body like the Royal College or the NICE sit together and make a guideline for treating this condition. I think once these two things are established, then it becomes mandatory for all health providers to be able to deliver the service. Because we know if we don't have the service, have, have the commissioning service, even if we have a brilliant GP or a brilliant nurse and she wants to make an independent clinic to support these cancer survivors with early menopause, let's call it doctors induced menopause, or uh, or genital rental dysfunction, she will have no funding to support that. And even if they started sometimes it fades away because there's no funding. And funding comes by what we call commissioning codes, and commissioning codes comes from the NHS England, which guided by the guidance from the Royal College and the, and the Royal College and NICE, they need a medical condition to so it's kind of like a more of a reciprocal yeah and very like a dumb dumb thing and if we want to move it we just gotta put the pillars right up there this is the condition this is the pillars required and we need to erect them up to be able to to provide that safety of, of for this patient for the treatment to be delivered consistently yeah and you can expect an email from me um <laughs> later <laughs> after we finish recording about step one <laughs> Um, in the meantime, because I like the analogy of looking at breast reconstruction or mastectomies and how breast reconstruction wasn't part of the initial sort of um, services provided. I really like the analogy. It really makes sense in comparison to where we're at with the menopause. However, what doesn't sit very well with me is I don't want to be waiting for 20 or 30 years. It might take that time and it's OK. We, we're in we're in it for the long game but in the meantime people that are listening to our conversation here i know you're very um a positive person about communicating you want cancer treatment to be a whole family affair which i know is really important to you how can we as patients who are listening to our conversations who know we deserve and need more help have constructive conversations with our doctors we know many doctors push back and say you can't have vaginal estrogen for example when in fact we have plenty of evidence that vaginal estrogen is safe even for people who've had breast cancer even for people who might be on aromatase inhibitors there's more research coming out now about the safety of it we know we're still lacking the big RTAs, the randomized control trials, but we're working towards educating more people. How can we as patients have a conversation with our doctors or how can we get the help that we need in the meantime until we work on our grand plan? <laughs> I think I think the number one, remember to start with, is 30% or 70% only go and seek help, uh, most of them after two years. I think this is yeah. something we need to break, yeah? And exactly that's what you do in this podcast for, just like don't be uh, uh, part of the 30%. We want to be all these 7% will have menopause, degenerative dysfunctions, cancer treatment, whatever type of cancer you had, you need to know, right, yes, thank you very much. You got me through this step to get my life back, but now I want my life as fully as possible back. And losing my hormonal function and my genital renal function is actually is uh, taking a big chunk of my quality of life. 
So that's, just, and I would start by visiting the GP or the clinic and ask specialist, or if you have an oncology uh, uh, clinic, just go and talk to your oncologist, say, thank you, you've done me a great job here. But I really want you to to do, uh, to do expand a bit on your job, yeah, and guide me, how can I be treated safely here? Now, I understand GPs, probably that's not their speciality, so they may find it a bit difficult for them to make that decision. So. But what we are actually meant to think to do from the GPs is that they need to keep on that communication. So if they have the lady who's coming, I have the menopause symptom for post-cancer treatment, I need help. I would urge the GPs rather than send the patient away and say, well, I don't have anything to give you. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I heard stories from patients, don't know how truthful you guys are. So I'm going to just keep waiting for your life, you know, and that's not, not yeah. the, the good thing. And that could have happened for many, could have happened for an oncologist. I think I would urge to start with patients to go and ask the question and not feel like I am telling with by asking the question. I feel like families, as you said, supported cross-culturally because I think there is a big cultural variation when I work in areas where there are certain reserved cultures. This question is not asked for and it's kind of like, well, you know, you know, you should. And it goes to just spirituality of saying you should be, you're being, you know, unappreciative to your, to, to your spiritual beliefs that is you're being given life again. And now you're thinking about something self and greedy. So mm. that, that kind of psychology needs to be broken up. Well, this is not that. This is your right. You've been come to this life with this right. You are now have your life back. And you should, we are professionals, we should preserve that right as much as possible. So we need to, People who are listening to us today, to me that if you have that within your own family, probably something need, you need to be addressed. This is my own life. I'm giving back to it by the same way I came in. So I deserve it all. Go to a GP, understand the GP, may not have the full specialized knowledge because people think GPs are consulted in every speciality. They're brilliant mm -hmm. in delivering generic care, but they're not consulted, especially in every speciality. But I'll urge my colleague GPs is not to brush it off and connect with the hospital connect with a specialist and I urge my oncology colleagues and my clinical nurse specialist colleagues to search the evidence and try mm -hmm. to pay attention to that issue rather than actually get struggled with other lots of work they do yeah so and I think if we all try to wedge a few percentage of our busy time to, to look into this one then it becomes a standard of care eventually hoping at some stage that we'll get the the guideline and we can get the, the the proper support that has become a full-on healthcare service, part of the whole call, uh, healthcare service commission treatment. Uh, and I hope it shouldn't take us 20, 30 years. We know the story <laughs> from another allergy from Herceptin. When Herceptin came and we knew Herceptin could double the survivor breast cancers, we were struggling to get it and it just funded because it was expensive drug. And it just been few good ladies were out on the TV and the BBCs and you know there was the voice of the women out there again and it was really good and Herceptin was approved in a very short period of time and it's one of the mm. best things we've ever done to breast cancers. So yeah, so general awareness, specialized awareness, attention and care, give it a little bit of time, speak up about it, don't be hiding in dark, something can be done and don't live with it. That's all, this is probably the bullet point of what I would say. And we're going to end the conversation here because I could have never wrapped it up any better than you with your last sentence. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dad. It's always great to see you. Always good to talk to you. <laughs> thank you. Can I ask you a last question? When I met you in November at a workshop, I met you in person and we had a whole panel of experts and a whole group of women who have been affected by menopause and cancer. I kept wondering, and I'm still wondering today, why were you interested in knowing more and talking about the menopause? Because when I spoke to you there, you spoke with such passion, with such care. You really wanted to help each person that was sitting in that room. Where did that curiosity come from, from your side? Well, it uh, started predominantly when I started doing uh, uh, gynecological malignancies. And to be honest, the group of cervical cancer ladies, they were the most intriguing ones because they were young women. And these were the easy ones to give them HRT, but it wasn't given. And and then the, when you try to talk about this, it talks about as a anatomical damage that may have happened, and 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 then what can be done. And then you see the struggle and the stories that come to me about how much the marriage breakdown and everything that's 
Now, in about five of me privately, I work support my wife business who does have a women aesthetic clinics, which is to do with the women aesthetic services. The ladies require anti-wrinkle therapies and treatments. And I do support her with that, with her, with her business and all within my own NHS contract. And among those ladies, they were the ladies who coming up talking about, can I get aesthetic treatments? Because also mm -hmm. that's something they, they feel like they sh you shouldn't have it. And so that, it's like, why can't you think you have it? Because, well, and then, and then after that, there was a woman who said, oh, well, I'll actually, if this is work to help me there, can it hurt work in my private Well, I don't know. Let me go and search. You know, and then when I went and searched, there actually there are some non-invasive, non-hormonal treatments, either uh, nutraceuticals or sometimes injectables can be done to help that. So this is kind of like got more and more knowledge about this. I've been invited by three other four international conferences to present, and a amount of interest came from the healthcare professionals. I mean, it was amazing. Like I'm going next week to Romania. Last week I was in, 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 you know, in, in London and Egypt. And a lot of people now knowing there's actually something can be done with its safety and that people feel like they can benefit from it either aesthetically within the cell or even gynecologically. And that feel like, well, if this is a problem, if I'm genuine about my percent of problem, I feel like I've been gifted with a tool. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't keep it to myself. So <laughs> nice, start yeah. visiting always meeting people like yourself said, let's keep that on open. Let's let's try to bring that awareness up because why not everybody can benefit from it? Yeah. And when you talk about aesthetics, do you mean Botox and fillers and yeah. plastic surgery in your face? Or, or what what do you mean when you talk about aesthetics? Well, aesthetics, yeah. Aesthetic that there there are the facial aesthetics and there's a body aesthetic and there's a gynecological aesthetic, yeah. And now we know aesthetic working side and side and function because the certain organs of the body, especially body, they will as if they don't look right, they don't function right. Let's take the example of breast cancer. If they lose a breast cancer, aesthetic it doesn't look well. If you put well, well, then get confident. Even sometimes if you put the weight balance correct, then you get the spine. So if you, things in our body look uh, similar to its original look or it's equal, then it functions. However, with facial aesthetics, sometimes we don't need to look any different to function differently. But we know if we look comfortably well within ourselves, we will perform better in our day-to-day -day living. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. not just women; that's also men. People who actually have issues about and that's why Botox, as you mentioned, the term is uh, is have the medical license, the subscription medicine, and even is licensed to be a medical treatment because there's enough evidence to say people who have psychologically affected by the, the wrinkles, they actually, if you treat the wrinkles psychologically, they behave and perform better. Now, mm. cancer patients, yes, they can have a static treatment, can have it, and they can have it within a good time. If they're on treatment, you got to make sure they are not at the time where the chemotherapy blood count may be low, their risk of infection, risk of bleeding, but if they are survived the cancers and wish to have their anti therapies, they may have surgical treatment. They always have, I always say with cancer patients, especially if you are using injectables or invasive procedures, you got to be a little bit more careful because the cancer treatment may have affected the, the actual collagen amount of the skin, the actual repair system of the skin, and, and we, we can see cancer patients, they have more more who have chemotherapy role, more long term wrinkles than actually non cancer patients and they lose a lot of the patient fat volume more than non cancer patients. So if you are going to be able to do these procedures, make sure you're well trained. Yes, yeah, so don't don't go to somebody who is actually on the back street. Probably go to a good doctor, a good nurse, a good dentist, good GP who has been well trained, they're well insured. And I might advise to the healthcare professionals be as minimal as possible don't overdo it with them just be what is required and do it as minimal as possible because then the risk of if complication to happen become always lower yeah mm -hmm. so it can be done please go to the good hands go to the good clinic don't chase for the price but my advice to clinicians <laughs> when you do it don't deny them do it on the right time if you have questions speak to oncologists and deliver the smallest and the gentlest amount required for that patient need, even if you have to do it over stages. Yeah, because mm. complication habit is easier to rectify. 
I wonder whether we have to do a whole conversation about aesthetics uh, after cancer treatment, because the conversations yeah. in our groups are very torn. Women often say, oh, I'd like to do this, but I feel guilty. I'm so lucky I've survived. Now it's about my looks. Am I sort of going mad? It shouldn't be about my looks. I'm so grateful I'm here. And so these are really difficult conversations. I'm sure it's a conversation for another time, but you must it, hear it that is. a lot. It is. It is. I mean, I mean, the, the, the uh, guilt uh, feeling sometimes of surviving cancer, because it's uh, it's a big thing. It's not just about uh, facial aesthetic. It's not about. It's also about uh, starting a, a new a new life, starting a new career. And sometimes, uh, sometimes people feel like they don't have their life on to them anymore. They become more fatalistic. Yeah, it's like. You know, even though I'm survived, but I'm, I'm grateful that I'm alive. And they've sometimes changed their spiritualities in, in the way. So they do 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 big changes sometimes. And they start less and less and less looking into them themselves. Yeah. And I'm doing so sometimes end up being in a very negative downward spirals. They start probably not spending money on good clothing if they want to, to buy. They may not be doing the good hair color because no, I'm not going to color my hair anymore. That's vanity. Uh, attending the, the, the health the clinic or the beauty clinics as they do before, having some aesthetic treatment, and also being able to open a new hobby and try to do a new thing. So you're right. The, the issue of kind of like getting your self-esteem back and feeling confident in life that I deserve to enjoy it to a maximum as much as I can to like anyone else, this is another big topic. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's like, can there can is the relationship broke down because of cancer is happening a lot i can have a good new relationship yeah mm -hmm. and if i want to do great with my day-to-day -day life and i require injectables i suppose it yes it, i deserve to have that if i want to buy fashion and clothing i deserve to do that and you're right and, and sometimes you gotta have some people go on the very negative part of it but also you have the other people who go to the very maximum part of it because overspending sometimes is a big problem with cancer patients when they survive, they start flashing all and borrowing more money because I want to live my life not to maximum. So it's an issue that you need to be addressed with good to 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 to, to be given in a balance. I, I remember uh, a good lady one years ago, she had incurable what what it thought to be incurable brain tumor. And I'm gonna put this story quickly in the sixth time. So she said, Okay, um they're there. So she went on the spend. Yeah, she had good credit cards, good there, she was credible. So she was spending, spending, and just enjoyed my life to maximum. And out of very rarity, that good woman, she survived it. And then she suffered with depression because of the debt she accumulated by overspending. Wow. So, yeah, so that that's, that's the other part of the story, but it comes from, from the same quote, how to manage. So what we really, if we're going to summarize what we talked good about today, is how to manage your life of the cancer. What is cancer? Yeah, of course. Cancer? Yeah. And part of it is the menopause, part of it is the look, part of it is the day-to-day -day living. And and honestly, I mean, you, you could have a, a full bunch of textbooks there <laughs> to give up yeah. what, what each at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the stories of an oncologist, uh, you could probably write the book about the stories that you have followed your patients for years, right? You follow patients for years and years and years sometimes, and you hear their stories and their dilemmas. And Danny, every patient is a book for me. Honestly, yeah. every patient is a book. The one whether uh, young or old, the one who is uh, within the country, outside the country, whatever they come, everyone comes with their own story and everyone has his own thing to learn from. Yeah. And all you can go by is the facts and the evidence you have. That That's what you can guide us with, right? And then we're all so different. So of course, we're going to do and feel very differently about the treatments you prescribe, about the the states of being like menopause, you put us in. For some people, it's going to be a really big thing and other people are not going to worry about it that much. It's really hard for you to navigate as well as a doctor. You're right. And let's take us to the point we need uh, the former guidance from a former professional body with the proper guidelines to say, you are now addressing this, a medical condition. We've been put together the guidelines which require but the menopause treatment but also could include the aesthetic, aesthetic treatment and the body aesthetic treatment, which start from breast reconstructions to body hair, which can result from treatment because women can get body hair problem after cancer treatment. So, so all, 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 all these things can be put as a document is to, to help 
uh, women who survive cancer, and men as well, to some extent, which I mentioned, less of a problem, but men also suffer from the survivorship problems after cancer, is how to make them enjoy life. That's what we want to do. Enjoy life in balance, like everybody else. Thank you so much. You've just written the job spec for your next project. <laughs> and forward, I'm yeah. going... I know. And I'm going to invite you back, if that's okay, in a few weeks or a few months' time to talk about collagen. You mentioned collagen. It's always a question to talk about facial aesthetics, skin a little bit more. How can we improve our skin? Because it's a question so many have, if that's okay. I look conversation. I absolutely thank look forward. Thank you so much and have a great start to January. And thank you for your time and all you do for us. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much. And please let me know how much it can be helped at any time. Well... He sounds so interesting and definitely we need to get him on board with some of our projects, don't we? And also how interesting when we spoke about all the aesthetic side, I could really sort of see a passion there. And I wonder if you would think it's a good idea to get him back on to talk about collagen and maybe some aesthetics treatments. There's so much to unpick there. But my poem, I want to read you my poem. Amidst the trials in the face of strife. Stands a woman, the change maker in life. You. Her bravery soars, a beacon of might. In the realm of health, she ignites delight. She walks through the storms, undeterred, unafraid. With passion and courage, her path she has laid. Fighting for wellness in every stride, for women's health, she stands with pride. Her voice resonates, breaking barriers tall. Championing change, she answers the call. For those unheard, she lends her grace. Their stories and struggles she boldly will embrace. She's the hero we need, her actions profound. Revolutionising health, turning it around. With each step she takes, a difference she makes. Her bravery and strength, the world awakes. Let's hail these women, we acclaim. In their quest to health, they etch their name. For change makers, brave and true, women's health thrivers, that is you. I love this and um, I want to share it with you. And if you are one of those people who have never engaged with us, you might have never um, popped into the Facebook group and left a comment. You might have never emailed or left a review or commented on our social media posts. It's okay. You are a change maker in your own right for yourself just by being here and by listening to these conversations. Everyone does their own thing. Some people share openly and some people are more reserved and it's okay. Don't feel there is a right or a wrong way of navigating this. Just know even if you're one of the quiet people at the back, we have also got your back. <laughs>